Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you to the ninth lecture of this NPTEL MOOCs course titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is the third lecture of module 3 and overall it is ninth lecture. So, today we will talk about how uh, some of the personality variables uh, influence our stress reaction. So, before we talk about today's lecture, let us have a brief recap of the last lecture that is lecture 8. So, in the last lecture uh, we uh, actually last two lecture we have been talking about the concept of post traumatic growth and in last lecture specifically we were talking about uh, the various theoretical explanation of PTG or post traumatic growth, how post traumatic growth happens and what are the theoretical explanations to it. So, in that uh, we try to look into some of the popular models. So, we have discussed uh, uh, Janoff Bullman's uh, three explanatory models uh, and these models were no, uh, where PTG reports or experiences were explained using three models. One is uh, strength to, through suffering. So, that was one of the idea that you know this was a kind of common idea. Uh, in, the, in our collective consciousness that, that you know we develop strength or we kind of realize our hidden potential uh, through suffering. Uh, the second model was psychological preparedness. So, the idea was that you know adversities or crises in life or stressful experiences in life you know help us to prepare for the future stress simply because you know it changes our core beliefs and assumptive world in a different way. So, that you know whenever such future occurrences happens, uh, we are more prepared for it. And the third model was existential re-evolution. So, it basically that talks about uh, how in the context of traumatic experience, people get involved into existential questions and meaning making process and how all this you know uh, uh, through the process of meaning making post traumatic growth can happen. So, we have discussed these three models of Janoff Bullman. Uh, then we have discussed the process of PTG using functional descriptive model proposed by Tedeschi and Calhoun, which is one of the most popular uh, theory of post traumatic growth, uh, which basically use the metaphor of earthquake to understand how PTG happens. So, they kind of use the use this metaphor of earthquake where they said that. Uh, as earthquake shatters physical structures in our world in the physical world. Similarly, traumatic events are like earthquakes in our mental world which shatters mental structures particularly our belief systems, our core ideas, schemas, assumptive worlds. And when we rebuild those mental structures as a learning process we rebuild them in such a way that they are more stronger and more resistant to future shock as we do it while rebuilding physical buildings after you know uh, uh, earthquakes. So, it, it was a similar kind of metaphor that happens. Uh, they use this metaphor to explain how PTG happens and they use then elaborate processes and the factors that are involved in the post traumatic growth particularly you know uh, how traumatic event causes distress by you know shattering our assumptive world and leads to various PTSD symptoms and then in the process of how we can you know reduce this distress by using self disclosure and social support and how this uh, initial remunerative thoughts which are automatic and intrusive re experiencing uh, you know symptoms of post traumatic stress can be converted into more reflective and conscious thought which may lead to post traumatic growth. So, all this detailed process we have discussed. 
Uh, then we have also discussed organismic valuing theory of PTG, uh, which was proposed by Joseph and Linley in 2005. They used the idea of humanistic psychology that you know all human beings are intrinsically motivated towards growth. So, whether we actually achieve growth or not, but this motivation is there in, inside all of us that we want to grow and expand in our life. So, PTG is consistent with that idea of growth. So, even though many things get shattered by traumatic event, this inner motivation help us to rebuild our world, which is, which incorporates uh, the growth and expansion in life. They use the idea of assimilation ac accommodation to explain the diverse outcomes of trauma. Uh, assimilation is primarily when we, you know, add new information to the existing knowledge structure and accommodation is when we change our existing knowledge structure to fit new information. So, they said uh, if, if we do assimilation, uh, if we engage in assimilation process after traumatic event, uh, it will lead to recovery and people will kind of get back to the pre-trauma baseline functioning level. However, accommodation can happen in two ways where no, you just whole mental structure gets changed and if you do negative accommodation, then obviously your mental structure go change, but in the negative direction, uh, which explains all the psychopathologies such as PTSD, you know, and other disorders. However, you know, there can be possible positive accommodation where you change your mental structure, but it is in the positive direction. Uh, such changes can explain the PTG and other thriving experiences. Uh, then we have also discussed the relationship between PTG and well-being and uh, most of the research show there is a positive relationship between uh, post-traumatic growth experiences and the indicators of well-being such as self-esteem you know and uh, other functionings. Uh, PTG has also been correlated with the wisdom, idea of wisdom and uh, it is inbuilt in the you know functional descriptive model as well uh, that you know uh, post-traumatic growth is kind of related to the development of wisdom that is a learning experience insight into life after experiencing you know a crisis in life and there is not much research available but at least some research indicates that both are positively related constructs and then we have discussed how ptg can be facilitated in our life particularly you know using uh, tedeschi and colhoun suggestions they said you know uh, one of the main thing that can facilitate post traumatic growth is called as expert companionship where you know if there are people around you who can empathically listen to you, to your problems and struggles and, and uh, that empathic and listening and active listening ear is very important. Uh, if that is available, uh, then PTG is facilitated at much uh, better pace. And also they talked about specific pathways, other pathways that can facilitate PTG such as you know, better you know understanding about the traumatic experience, education, edu getting educated to what trauma does to you and the processing of traumatic experiences in terms of how it is you know, shattering your core beliefs. These are very important for PTG. Emotion regulation or coping strategies which can you know reduce your overwhelming emotion is very important so that you come to your senses and, uh, and get into the process of you know reflective processes for PTG to happen. Self disclosure is another factor they said very important because until and unless you discuss and talk about PTG, it is you no know, your traumatic experiences, uh, PTG is not likely to happen. Uh, narrative development is very important where you, know, you develop a coherent narrative after the traumatic event, a new narrative of your life uh, so that you kind of break from the uh, older narratives and get into the new chapter of your life. So, that is also very important and services serving people who are of similar victims of trauma or survivors of trauma uh, can also facilitate PTG to you. So, that you know you also are not just concerned about yourself and you kind of extend your support to other people who are similar to it and by looking at their struggle also many times people experience PTG. So, these are some of the things that we have discussed in the last class. Uh, today, we will talk about how personality factors influences our stressful experiences. 
So, in that context, we will talk about you know uh, type A, type B, uh, psychological hardiness and locus of control. So, these are some of the important concepts uh, that we will discuss today. When you talk about the concept of personality, uh, in psychology we mean, what do we mean by personality? Uh, we mean very specific thing in the sense that you know, when we talk about personality variable, basically it includes an individual's unique and relatively consistent patterns of behavior, thinking or feeling or style of response. So, what is the relatively consistent patterns of thinking, feeling and acting? So, that makes what the concept of personality when we talk about it in the uh, psychological literature. So, this personality characteristics or traits differentiate one person from another person. So, that we can say this person is different from another person in terms of his characteristics. So, those characteristics which defines that person is actually uh, the personality traits or characteristics that makes that person. Uh, so, these are this may be very unique and consistent patterns of uh, thinking, feeling and behaving. So, we need to understand when you talk about something as personality characteristics, uh, these are relatively stable qualities. Uh, we do not say something as personality characteristics, if it changes on daily basis or after few days it changes, then it is not part of your personality, it is most likely influenced by the situation. So, personality characteristics are there is a temporal stability in it in, in, in the sense that you know it, it, it does not change so often uh, and then there is a cross situational consistency in it in the sense uh, it also does not change based on you know uh, changing situation too much. There may be some changes, but when it is very strong personality characteristics across situation you will show those characteristics. So, if I say somebody is extrovert or somebody is introvert, so these are kind of personality description. It means most of the time this person is likely to be extrovert, very outgoing, highly energetic, doing lot of activities. This could be some of the characteristics description of extrovert. So, those some of these personality characteristics are very strongly related to our stressful experiences. So, we will see some of these characteristics or personality traits. Uh, we will not go into too much of uh, the conceptual basis of personality and other thing, but there are many theories in personality. Uh, some are like trait theories, where they try to describe personalities using different traits, you know, uh, such as extrovert, introvert, and there are process oriented personality theories, such as psychodynamic theories or psychoanalysis, where they try to understand the different mechanisms of human personality and wha how a person becomes the way he or she is. So, there are different theories to explain what personalities are there. Uh, 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 so, this lecture is not about those description, but we are specifically interested into specific personality traits or characteristics that are relevant in the context of stress. So, personality traits may influence stress response. What kind of person you are? Uh, so, it will influence how you respond to stressful circumstances. Some personality traits are more prone to stress as compared to others. So, some people are more prone to stress, if there are stressful situations, they will be very much influenced by it. Some people are not so influenced by it, uh, simply because there are personality differences. So, one such personality trait uh, which is related to stressful experiences is called as type A and type B personality traits. Uh, we have discussed about it while discussing uh, in the context of how stress is connected to coronary heart disease. So, this this type these traits were specifically discovered uh, while doing research by two cardiologists. Uh, who are trying to understand you know is there any kind of some specific people are uh, are they at higher risk for heart disease. So, in that context they found that you know two types of personality traits are there which may have some connection with the heart diseases. 
and we have discussed in detail and typically I uh, will just briefly talk about it here and that they found two types of individuals in this context. One is type A individuals, uh, they are typically very competitive and achievement oriented kind of people, highly competitive ach achievement orientation is there. There is a lot of time urgency and these people also show a lot of anger and hostility sometimes which may be expressed and many times it may not be expressed also, but they have these characteristics. And type B people are just opposite, they are more relaxed, there is not much time urgency in their life, they are not much achievement oriented, so they are more easy going kind of people, more relaxed kind of people. Uh, so, because of these differences in the personality, a type A people are more likely to experience stress uh, because of their lifestyle, the, their psychological makeup, the kind of life situation they kind of you know put themselves into. Uh, because of their characteristics, uh, they are more likely to experience stress and high stress leads to various diseases that we have discussed elaborately in many lectures and it was found that type A people are more likely to have heart diseases primarily because of high stress response or high stressful experiences in their life. Uh, so, I will not go too much into that because we have already discussed about it uh, while discussing how stress is connected to uh, coronary heart diseases. Then another personality trait or characteristics which is connected to stress is called as psychological hardiness. So, before we talk about I will just give you some sample questions that are used to identify uh, people with the trait of psychological hardiness. So, I will just read out few sample items from DRS 15 questionnaire by Barton. Uh, which measures psychological hardiness. So, these are some of the items. So, people are asked whether these are true in their life or not. So, one item is most of my life gets spent doing things that are meaningful. I really look forward to my daily activities. By working hard, you can nearly always achieve your goals. How things go in my life depends on my own actions. I enjoy the challenge when I have to do more than one thing at a time. Changes in routines are interesting to me. So, these are some of the items that are used to measure psychological hardiness and you might have guessed that those people who says yes and they are high on these qualities, they are most likely to show uh, psychological hardiness. So, what is psychological hardiness? It is a concept or psychological concept to explain people's behavior and it was first introduced by a psychologist named Susan Kobasa in 1979. She defines hardness as a set of characteristics, these are set of characteristics that differentiate stress resistant people from those vulnerable to stress. So, and uh, hardiness is primarily characterized by three characteristics which are called as three C's which are commitment, control and challenge. So, the idea is the hardiness basically means in general sense we use the word hard or hardiness to mean something which is very strong. So, psychological hardiness basically means uh, some qualities makes some people psychologically very strong and they can endure a lot of pressure and stress in their life and perform under pressure you know in challenging tasks. So, these are some people are simply high on it and some people are not so high in it and uh, they are not able to, some people are not able to perform under pressure and uh, on challenging circumstances. 
so psychologically hardy people are basically those people who has this quality of stress resistance and ability to perform under pressure and stress and challenging circumstances and what are the characteristics of psychological hardiness so according to susan kabasa that there are three important characteristics that makes a person psychologically hardy or tough so these are basically i'll just write here so uh, these are the three qualities that are important or at least found in people who are psychologically hardy one is sense of commitment sense of control sense of challenge commitment is about your ability to remain involved with a task even in the face of stress and difficulties control is about your ability or your tendency to influence the outcome even when no, of significant events when it seems very difficult also you still try to make changes uh, and the sense of challenge is about you know looking at stressful circumstances as an opportunity to grow learn and develop oneself so these three qualities are very important and they kind of makes or you know uh, these qualities makes the the psychological hardiness uh, you know uh, or makes human the the, the, the whole mental setup uh, which can be defined as psychologically hardy so i will just uh, give little bit more definitions on these three characteristics so commitment uh, the people with strong commitment believe that it is important to remain involved with people and events that are significant no matter how stressful things become so if you have a high sense of commitment you believe that it is important to remain involved even at the face of highly stressful circumstances you try to involve if it is a significant task you try to involve and commit to the task even at the face of uh, highly stressful circumstances so they don't waste time in withdrawal alienation and isolation so generally people with high commitment then they don't run away so easily from the circus situation or from the task they don't withdraw so easily and run away and get alienated and isolated so the tendency is not there so if you have high commitment you would not run away so easily uh, you will try your best so this commitment could be with the task with the people in the relationships so it could be in diverse aspects so people with psychological hardiness has high commitment 
Second is sense of control. So, people with strong sense of control continue to have an influence on the outcomes of significant events going on around them, no matter how difficult this become. So, another thing is this sense of control is basically uh, we are talking about internal locus of control that we will discuss after this, which is also another trait or characteristics, personality characteristics connected with the stress. So, th this kind of uh, people they try to influence the event, try to make changes whatever is possible using their own skills and understandings, no matter how difficult this becomes. They still try to influence the outcome, try to change things. So, they do not let themselves slip into powerlessness and passivity. So, so easily though they do not become passive and powerless. They try to make influence or, or try to change outcomes as much as possible. So, people with psychological hardiness has high sense of control. The third quality is sense of challenge. Uh, people with strong sense of challenge interprets stress as normal and regular part of life. So, stress is something is a normal and everyday part of life and provides an opportunity to learn, grow and develop. So, when you see something as challenging, you do not just you know get defeated by it, but see it as an opportunity, so that I can expand my skill and learn and grow out of it. They believe that comfort and security is not our birthright. So, I mean you do not always seek comfort while doing no. If you always seek comfort, then you, are, you will not be able to do anything significant in your life. So, people with high sense of challenge, they are comfortable in putting themselves in challenging circumstances because they see it as an opportunity to learn, grow and develop. So, these three characteristics provide uh, psychologically hardy individuals the necessary courage to face stressful situations and grow out of them. So, these are the three important characteristics that, that are found in the people with psychological hardiness. So, uh, this is also interesting how this whole concept was developed uh, through a long longitudinal research. So, the initial research on hardiness uh, actually came from a 12 year longitudinal study. So, uh, uh, this Maddy and Kobasa, these two uh, researchers, they studied 450 individuals for a period of 12 years. So, that is why it is called as a longitudinal study. When you study a set of people for certain length of time and collect data again and again after certain uh, time inter interval of time, then such studies are called as longitudinal study. So, they collected data from 450 male and female supervisors, managers and decision makers of Illinois Bell Telephone Company. So, it is an US telephone company uh, that was um, which is basically IBT con company and uh, they collected data from people at the high post who who are doing lot of stressful job like supervisors, managers and decision makers from 1975 to 1987 and uh, the objective of their study was to find out individual differences in the stress reaction you know are there people who are more resistant to stress and some people more vulnerable to stress uh, and uh, they were trying to look at those individual differences in terms of stress reaction. So, at the start of the experiment in that company, uh, that company was under federal regulation at that time. After the 6 years of the study, so they started in 1975, uh, that is in, then in 1981 some deregulation happens and hit the company. So, it was no longer under federal regulation, so it was deregulated and as a result of this drastic change, a lot of chaos happened in the company uh, in terms of you know job losses, in terms of changing the structure etcetera and it can be uh, evidence, uh, this evidence came from the fact that uh, th this company reduced its employee from 26,000 to 14,000 in just one year. So, it, it was a kind of chaotic situation in that company and still they were collecting data and it 
they have been collecting data and it happened in between the study. So, the, the, the data collected 6 years after the event, they still collected data after the event till 6 years and they found that from their sample, two third of that sample suffered and collapsed in terms of performance problem, violence, absenteeism, divorce, health problems such as heart attacks, mental problem etcetera. So, they found two third of their sample actually collapsed under these stressful circumstances. Uh, and this collapse was in terms of performance, absenteeism and many you know personal issues in their life and many diseases also disorders also. However, interestingly they found other one third of the sample they not only survived actually they thrived in their career after this all the chaotic situation in the company. So, those sample you know many of them uh, left the company and many many of them actually rose in the position and they actually thrived they grew out of that experience and made sin significant contributions and some started their own firms etc so two third guy collapsed under the pressure or the stress of the new changes in the company our one third not only survived, they actually thrived out of that experience. And they found the difference between these two third and one third was actually explained by the psychological hardiness that is people with a sense of commitment, control and challenge. So, this one third who survived and thrived actually were more psychologically hardy and having these three important qualities that help them to survive and grow out of that pressure. And, uh, uh, and the stressful circumstances. So, from that they took this idea and the many researches were conducted later on uh, and they found this is an important concept in terms of facing stressful circumstances in life. So, many researches were conducted uh, later on also I mean uh, so hardiness has been found to be negatively related to both self report and objective measures of stress. So, people with uh, high sense of hardiness, they generally experience or at least perceive less stress both in terms of subjective as well as objective measures such as blood pressure and it hardiness was positively associated with psychological well being. So, that was also uh, people with high psychological hardiness were having better well being also. Research also shows that hardiness buffer against the development of anxiety and depression. So, generally it is it serves as a protective factors in psychological disorders also such as anxiety and depression. So, this helps you to protect from psychological disorders. Research also shows that hardiness serves as both protective factors and a resource that promotes the ability to experience psychological growth following stressful and traumatic event. So, it is both it serves as a resource as well as protective factor. So, it protects you from the stressful life circumstances and its pressure and also it provides as a kind of resource. So, you have more psychological resources to deal with the problems of life simply because the because of these qualities you have a different outlook towards life. Research also shows that hardy individuals appraise stressful events less negatively. So, that is why they experience less because as we have already seen in the first lecture that stress is more about how you appraise it, how you perceive it rather than objective situation. No? So, that perception plays very important role and it shows that hardy individuals appraise stressful event less negatively. Uh, research also shows that hardiness was associated with lower PTSD symptoms among Vietnam veterans. So, veterans who had more psychological hardiness, they reported less PTSD symptoms and it buffered the impact of compact combat exposure on PTSD development. So, it also protected them from the combat exposure and the trauma. A psychological hardiness research was also conducted on performance indicators, how people perform under stressful circumstances and uh, many uh, research shows that 
uh, individuals high in hardiness have shown better performance under stress in diverse environmental and occupational situations such as you know military job academic job sports firefighting job businesses in all this context it has been found that people with high psychological hardiness seems to perform better under stressful circumstances and many of this uh, you know uh, job are inherently stressful research also shows that hardiness also predicts better performance longitudinally basically as the time passes and helps to buffer stress within a stressful environment people with high hardiness responds in a facilitative way to the negative stressors in the environment so this is also very important quality so under stress they kind of uh, work in a facilitative way rather than you no know, getting away from it they kind of get involved into it and kinds of perform better so their performance gets facilitated under stressful circumstances now uh, in general the personality traits or characteristics are not easy to change or make changes in them uh, but at least some research shows that hardiness can be trained although it can be a part of one's personality but it can be changed or at least it can be developed in persons with some training modules so several studies have reported that hardiness can be taught to people medi uh, in 1987 developed a um, hardiness training program to enhance the quality of hardiness among people so some training modules have been developed and still many people use that so they propose uh, this um, medi and other his colleagues who are doing core research in hardiness you know they propose that uh, hardiness training engages cognition emotion and action in coping effectively with the stressful circumstances and uses the feedback from this process to deepen commitment and control and challenge beliefs about oneself in the world so in hardiness training typically what they do is that in the teach people how to cope effectively in the environment or in a stressful circumstances and take feedback from uh, from this coping situations and increase or deepen uh, the sense of commitment control and challenge because these are three important qualities that needs to be enhanced for psychological hardiness so from while training coping uh, strategies they also teach how to use or increase these qualities of commitment control and challenge in different environment in, in different stressful circumstances so they they further said hardiness training is to teach trainees the skills of transformational coping so mostly a coping strategy which can transform you whereby one can decrease the stressfulness of circumstances through cognitively and emotionally exploring one's appraisal to them so one thing coping uh, we'll talk more about it in the last in the upcoming lectures so appraisal plays very important role interpretation plays very important role in the stressful circumstances so that teaches you how to appraise it in a differently so that you know stress becomes lower so that they reach broader perspective and deeper understanding and using this information to carry out decision and solve problems and second obviously uh, which is very important for training hard hardiness training is to use the feedback from the coping situation as i have already told to deepen uh, the perceptions of commitment control and challenge so there are specific modules uh, people use it so so i cannot go into too much into that but the basic idea is there you know these three qualities can be enhanced in a coping situation and by training people and some research shows that hardiness training can increase personality hardiness and decrease subjective and objective signs of stress and they found that result actually persisted over a long time at least for 6 month follow up period some later study also indicated that hardiness training is more effective than some other um, coping strategies such as relaxation 
placebo and support conditions for increasing sense of hardiness. So, that training was much more better in, in terms of increasing hardiness quality as compared to other coping strategies. Okay. So, the next uh, personality characteristics that is connected to stressful circumstances or it influences stressful stress reaction is called as locus of control. So, again uh, here before talking about what is locus of control, we will uh, talk about few sample items from another scale that was developed by Rotters to measure your locus of control. So, these are three sample pair of items. So, one may be more correct for you, one individual and other statement may be correct for another individual. So, first pair of sentence talks about a becoming a success is a matter of hard work, luck has little or nothing to do with. So, one person may believe in it or b getting a good job depends mainly on being in the right place at the right time. So, this could be another belief among individuals. So, some people may believe in first part of A statement much more than B statement. Second, A what happens to me is my own doing. B sometimes I feel that I do not have enough control over the direction my life is taking. So, again these are two different statement for some people one may be true for some people other may be true. Third, most people do not realize the extent to which their lives are controlled by accidental happening. B, there is no such thing as luck. So, you can understand uh, this three pairs of statement, one pair is more about inner control or you have a sense that you can make changes in life, you have more control over things in your life and other statement is about you do not have much control over your life, things depends on external circumstances. So, based on this idea some people are actually more inner oriented or they find causality inside causality of actions and outcomes inside themselves and some people are more prone to find causes outside themselves. So, this is what is locus of control is all about. So, Rotter who is one of the main researcher who started this research in the area of locus of control who proposed this term proposed the concept of locus of control which was found to differentiate people on stress vulnerabilities. So, this also differentiate people who are highly vulnerable to stress and not so vulnerable to stress. He coined the term locus of control to describe individuals generalized beliefs about causality and control. What is the belief about causes of actions and outcomes? So, these are generalized beliefs. So, people in general some people think like that and in general some people think in some other ways. So, locus of control includes our general expectancies about the connection between one actions and outcomes. What is the connection between your action and outcome that happens in your life? Locus of control refers to the generalized expectancy to perceive outcomes in life as a result of either one's own action and within one's control which is called as internal locus of control as opposed to being determined by external factors such as chance or powerful others which is called external locus of control. So, locus of control uh, basically could be of two types.
So, there can be two locus of control. So, depending on the origin of your sense of control, whether your sense of control is coming from within yourself or center of sense of control is outside yourself. So, what is your belief, general belief about uh, the causality of your actions and outcomes? If you believe it is within you, then it is internal locus of control. If you more likely to believe that the causality lies outside you, then it is called as um, people with external locus of control. So, internal locus of control, uh, people with internal locus of control, so people may differ. Some people are more oriented towards internal locus of control, some people are more oriented towards external locus of control. So, people with internal locus of control generally expect that, that their action will lead to predictable outcomes and consequences. So, they have more internal uh, locus of control. So, they believe their own actions will make differences in the uh, outcomes. So, they tend to make internal attributions that things are happening because of my internal actions or my actions by explaining what happens to them as due to their internal or personal factors. So, if I say uh, I succeeded because of my hard work. So, hard work is an internal factor or if I say I failed in a situation uh, because the task was very difficult or situation was not favorable to me, then you are making an external uh, attributions. So, external locus of control, uh, people uh, with external locus of control generally expects that outcomes are more influenced by external factors such as luck, chance, etcetera. They tend to make external attributions by explaining what happens to them as due to external or circumstantial factors. So, people with high internal locus of control generally try to master their environment, while those with high external locus of control often perceive that outcomes in life are outside their control and feel helpless. So, this psychological makeup or individual differences you know has an effect on your perception of life and uh, your persistence on a task uh, simply because you know it will influence your uh, sense of perception and uh, what possibilities are there in your life. Uh, so, people with internal locus of control, they will try to make changes and master the environment, whereas external locus of control, they see because things are outside my control. So, they will not put much effort and to change it, they are more likely to feel helpless. So, thousands of studies indicate that internal locus of control is more beneficial as compared to external locus of control in the context of stress and health. For example, external locus of control are associated with ill health and internal locus of control was found to act as buffer against the effect of stress and health. So, people with high internal locus of control uh, are less likely to experience stress in their life simply because you know they are more actively coping with the situation. External locus of control people are mostly using avoidance and running away which does not solve lot of problems and at the end actually they experience more stress. So, people with internal locus of control seems to uh, have a beneficial effect of their sense of perception in terms of health and uh, dealing with the stressful circumstances. For example, an individual may make an external attribution or external causality by believing that there is no point in joining a course or a professional course as it is very less likely that he will get a job in future. So, if he believes what is the point of joining a course if I do not get a job in it. So, he may feel I will not be able to get a job, job in this area. So, what is the point of uh, doing or joining a professional course. So, if a person makes such an external attribution, uh, there is a high chance that you know he or she may feel more stress and helpless. Furthermore, job stress is often related to lack of control over nature of work. So, many time you know uh, people who 
experience more stress in their job situation, one of the reason is this external locus of control could be one of the important reason. However, it is also important to understand that extremes of either is not good actually. So, people with too extreme internal locus of control may become like perfectionist and they want to do everything on themselves, uh, which may not be also good in the long run. So, a decent sense of internal locus of control uh, is more beneficial than an extreme sense of internal locus of control. So, some people may have extreme sense of either of these two, which may not be very good. Uh, locus of control has also been related with the coping style. So, coping we will discuss more in the next class. So, locus of control has been associated with certain coping style. For example, external locus of control has been associated with avoidance coping. People with external locus of control are more likely to avoid situation as a coping or resignation uh, in the context of greater stress. Uh, and they experience more stress and poor health. On the other hand, internal locus of control uh, has been associated with help seeking, positive thinking, lower level of work stress in general. So, they use more proactive and more healthy coping strategies to deal with the stress. One particular theory uh, which of attribution or finding causality has been linked with locus of control, which is called as Weiner's theory of locus attribution theory. This theory was specifically developed to explain uh, how people find out causes in an achievement situation or when they succeed or fail in a task, how the people explain their success and explain their failure, what are the factors that influences that. So, that was his whole idea of theory. Uh, Weiner incorporate this notion of locus of control in his theory uh, to understand how people explain their success and failures. So, he proposed that in order to predict people expectancies and behaviors specifically in the context of achievement situation, it is important to evaluate how the causes of the outcome is perceived in terms of locus of causality, controllability and stability. So, he said there are three important set of factors which are very important uh, in terms of how people explain their life situation specifically in the context of success and failure. Whether they explain it using internal locus of control or external locus of control or in terms of stability, whether it is a stable factor or unstable factor or controllability whether it is a controllable factor or uncontrollable factors that caused happen, uh, success and failure. So, this is so we'll look into little bit more into that what are these three factors. So, according to Weiner uh, success and failures can be analyzed in terms of these factors. So, locus of control we have already explained. Uh, we may believe a cause is internal locus of control, if its origin is within us, we say it is because of internal locus of control, you uh, know, uh, I failed or succeeded in a situation or is it because of an external locus of control, if the cause originate in our environment or circumstances or outside ourselves. So, for example, you know, hard work is an internal factor, whereas luck or characteristics of the situation or the task in which you are doing, it is an external factor. Second is stability. So, internal factors and an external factor can also differ in their stability. If you believe a cause is stable, it is less likely to change over time. So, stable factors do not change often and unstable factors, they change easily. So, for example, hard work is an unstable factor because we can change our level of hard work. I can work very hard or not so hard. So, it is kind of changeable or unstable factors. Stable factors could be like uh, my ability and intelligence. You know, you cannot change your ability and intelligence in you know, you know, you know, you know in, in days and weeks and months. This is more stable qualities which is influenced by genetics, environment, so many things. 
So, uh, factors could be stable, unstable and then later they added one more factor called controllability. So, some we can believe or uh, we can voluntarily change a controllable factor and while an uncontrollable factor is one that we believe cannot change easily. So, it is kind of related to stability factors, but it some times it may differ also in certain circumstances. So, in that context again mostly you know let us let us say uh, you know, effort and motivation is a controllable factor and let us say ability and intelligence are uncontrollable factors. So, these three sets of factors influence our explanation of life situations particularly in the context of success and failure. So, according to Weiner success or failure can be attributed to internal personal causes or external situational causes and this internal external factors could be either stable or unstable and they focused on four important uh, factors that play significant role in our achievement situation in terms of uh, finding causes. One is ability, efforts or motivation, luck and task difficulty based on these factors. So, I will just show you how this, this um, interact with these factors. So, if you uh, use this locus of control and stability, so this could be the four important factors. Uh, so, internal uh, stable is ability, internal unstable is effort, hard work or motivation. So, external stable factor is like task difficulty, whatever you are doing, uh, ta whatever task that you want to do in the in terms of whatever situation you are. So, it is external in terms of and uh, it is stable in the sense you do not have much control over it. Uh, so, whatever task is given you need to do it. So, in that sense it is called as a stable factor. Then uh, external unstable factor one factor that influences our decision is luck which basically means you do not know wh whether you will become lucky or unlucky it is very unstable sometimes you feel lucky sometimes you feel unlucky. So, luck is an unstable factor. So, these four characteristics you know uh, factors play a very important role uh, in terms of our uh, explaining our successes and failure or achievement situations in our life. So, stability uh, attributions whether a factor is stable or unstable, it will influence our expectancy or prediction about the future. So, if you think an factor is uh, an stable factor is caused my success and failure, uh, it is likely to influence your prediction about future. So, if it is a stable, you are not likely to give much effort for future or you know in terms of expectations of what will happen in future. However, it is, if it is unstable, you are likely to have you know, different expectations or at least you, have, you will have expectation that th things could change in future. 
controllability influences our persistent on a task. So, if you believe a factor is controllable, you will put more effort in it. If you believe it is uncontrollable, uh, you will likely to run away or avoid it. Locus of control influences our emotion reaction. So, whether you are using an, uh, no, you are an internal locus of control or using an external locus of control explanation, depending on the situation there may be diverse emotional reaction, positive, negative, etcetera. Uh, so, let us give an example how it can influence. Uh, let us say a student fail in an exam and there are two cases. In one case, the student is attributing his failure to lack of ability. So, a student fail in an exam and he sees or at least explains himself that he failed because of his lack of ability. What will happen to his uh, expectations and you know future future outcome, what are the possibilities. So, lack of ability is an internal stable uncontrollable factor. So, so it is an internal, but it is a stable and uncontrollable factor. So, it will influence his it will lead to low expectancy of future success because he is, his ability he is not able to perform well because he's he's having low ability if he perceives it like that then uh, he is not going to expect too much in the future it would likely to decrease his self esteem he may feel humiliation shame or leave or quit the situation simply because he feels you know there is no point in it because i am not able to do it or i don't have the ability to perform so, his expectancy for future will be very less, it will decrease his motivation and probably he will leave or quit the situation. However, on the other hand, let us say the student attributes the cause of his failure to lack of efforts. So, he said I failed because I know I did not put the necessary hard work. Lack of effort is an internal, but it is an unstable controllable factors. Then it will lead to more hopeful and positive anticipation because he can he will have a better anticipation for future simply because he thinks he can change the future because he can change his effort and may motivate him to amend what he has done uh, you know, wrong in the past because he can change it do more effort and change things in the future so you can see based on what kind of attribution a person does uh, whether it is internal what if, what if based on the locus of control, stability and controllability, outcomes can be very different. So, these are uh, uh, people uh, use all these explanations in their day to day life and uh, uh, this uh, may influence us. Some people you know intentionally, motivationally they use certain attributions. So, for example, in a case of success, people may you know interpret their environment in such a way to maintain their self esteem or positive self image. One may attribute their success to internal factors and failure to external factors. So, such kind of attribution also pro, you know, protects you that you know I succeeded because of my ability, my effort and when you fail you may say I failed because of you know situation was not good, people were not good in the success, they were doing lot of favors to other people etcetera, etcetera. So, sometimes we intentionally and intentionally do such attributions also to protect our self image. So, these are some of the factors that can influence our stress reaction in a certain situation. Uh, so, personality may also play important role. So, with this uh, I end today's lecture. Thank you.